It's a real pleasure, first of all, to see so many of you, but I'm not surprised because this is just a wonderful exhibition just to be enjoyed, enjoyed. It's, it's a real pleasure to have Jay Murphy back with us again. It's a long, long time ago since she brought the circus to our gallery. Uh, but this is a very different kind of a circus. And I think we have to say that we're very honored to have the original artist of this particular circus here, Lorna McMahon. <coughs> because it's such a pleasure to have her. A garden that has inspired many writers and painters and visual artists. <coughs> uh, and to open the exhibition, it's a real pleasure. Uh, to welcome back Ava Burke, <clears throat> an outstanding poet. Poets, I always say, are the best people to open exhibitions <laughs> because they can get in behind the canvas. They often understand the genesis of the idea of the whole theme and so on. So would you please welcome Ava Burke. <clears throat> And um, welcome to everybody here. I, I am delighted and honored to be here today and um, to open the show for my dear sister-in-law. We go back many, many years. Too many, I won't even. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, are, we have all come here to celebrate her new work which blazes with vivid colors on the walls of this gallery. The 34 pastels and oil paintings entitled Lorna's Garden are the result of the encounter of two creative artists and kindred spirits, Lorna McMahon and Jay Murphy, both skilled and experienced in their disciplines, both passionate about their art. There are parallels between painting and gardening. They each require study, practice, forward planning, and patience. Both artists must know about layout and design, have a grasp of form and color, make aesthetic choices, which, which shapes, which colors, to put side by side to set off each other, what kind of trees, fern, or shrub would look best in the foreground, what type of leaf blend with the dappled light and shade of a wooded grove, and so on. The plants alone require years of study. The gardener must be familiar with their names and origins, their needs, habits, and habitats. She must know how much light, how much shade, the type of soil, soil or fertilizer they require to thrive. And then the sheer groundwork, the physical labor required of gardeners and artists. Digging, planting, weeding, and perpetual minding on the one hand. The preparatory work of priming the canvas, choosing the paint on the other. The precise brush strokes, the effort it takes to bring the surface to life and give it a luminous and differentiated intensity as we can see all around us here. And there's another similarity, both the magical garden created by Lorna and Jay's pastels and canvases invite us to slow down, take a moment's respite, and simply look and enjoy the result of their work. The word garden from Indo-European yeah, to grasp, to enclose, reappears in the Irish word gort, meaning field, Old English geard, meaning fenced, enclosure, garden, and in some form or other in most European languages as 
Jardin, Jardin, Giardino, Garten, Orchard, Yard, and many more. And which is proof that gardens are something that we all share, no matter where we live. Um, over time, gardens increasingly came to mean a sanctuary from the noisy world. Andrew Marvel, in his poem entitled The Garden, described how he found fair, quiet, and delicious solitude here, how his soul would glide into the boughs and his mind distill from everything around him a green thought in a green shade. <coughs> Gardens are at the heart of myths and legends. They are sites of wonder, transformation, innocence, and seduction. Since we were expelled from the gardens of Eden, the yearning to return there and to recreate them has never left us. <coughs> Some gardens are places of solitude and meditation, intimate zones of rest <coughs> and restoration. Others are public, open, and democratic, where the high and low can meet. Natural <coughs> wilderness and cultivation intersect in gardens. The way humans form and inform the world they live in is a subject Jay has often imaginatively dealt with, and she has returned to the theme in this work. She went into Lorna's garden and sketched and drew under the trees, among the flowers and rocks, and the garden miraculously reappears in the frames of her painting. The pastels are exquisitely beautiful, intimate, and dreamlike. They quietly beckon you into their space, into the still mystery of the woodland, for example the muted light beneath a copse of trees where a flame-colored shrub makes a strong statement in the middle ground between mossy stones and tufts of grass. It's, a, it's Jay's secret how she manages to do it, but she always draws me into her images. I feel a physical pull to follow her path into the shadow beneath the trees that stand dark against a deep blue sky. For years, I've had one of Jay's seaside pastels hanging on the wall directly opposite my bed. And every morning, I make my way between the gorse and the creeping salt bush to the edge of the dune, hoping I can catch a glimpse of the sea beyond. She manages to create a sense of depth and height among the dune grasses and sea rocket. And every morning, I wonder how she does it. The oil paintings, on the other hand, display a fluency and power that are quite breathtaking. Although they too depict secret contemplative scenes in Lorna's garden, they are heightened in expression. Their colors are reminiscent of the palette of the expressionists. They are non-naturalistic, surreal. I love the visionary boldness of them. The red stairway, for instance, over there, curving upwards through the forest for past tall young trees and mounds of mossy rocks towards an unearthly brightness at the, at the top. It's a little like Tintoretto's presentation of the Virgin with its sweeping stone staircase winding upwards to a heavenly light. And then there's the blue, blue poppy motif. Whenever I visited Lorna's garden in the past, the gas flame blue of their blossoms took my, my breath away. The blue flower was a potent symbol of ro German romanticism. It meant the unattainable, metaphysical. It stood for poetry and inspiration. The romantics went on quests to find this blaue Blume, but usually the moment it seemed within reach, it disappeared. When I saw Jay's painting of the solitary Himalayan poppy in front of woodland rocks and ferns, I realized that the romantic, the romantic blaue Blume had been there all along in Lorna's garden, if the romantics had only known. <laughs> Jay has described the process of priming her canvases with red as a personal homage to her mother, who studied painting with Jamie Mellet, Jellet, Janet. Mimi Janet. Mimi Janet. had taught her students to use a red outline in the paintings. The burning intensity of the paintings is enhanced by this painterly trick. 
The line of trees in the background there, for instance, against the deep blue sky looks as if it could burst into flame any second, just like the fiery shrubs in the painting next to it, in another almost eerie painting, which is more a dreamscape than a garden, contrasts starkly with the light gray jagged rocks and the barren branches in the foreground. Sometimes you feel darkness or menace lurking in these shadows. Looking at these paintings, I was reminded of other great artists famous for their garden scenes. Gabriele Münter, for instance, who a hundred years ago portrayed the gardens of the Yellow House in Murnau in Bavaria over and over again. Or around the same time, Paula Becker, who painted haunting portraits of old women and young girls in fantastic farmer's gardens in the Borgland of Worpswede near Bremen. And of course, the great Georgia O'Keeffe, who made the deserts and canyons of New Mexico with their spectacular flora into her own garden and source of inspiration. These painters are among J. Murphy's direct forebears. And I hope you forgive me if I digress here with a personal memory. One summer, many years ago, J. stayed with us in Munich. We were all very young and she was a delight with her long black hair and flowing hippie skirts. <laughs> she and her partner Breen went to live for a few months in our small damp cottage outside Munich in an area of Borgland, boggy flatlands that had been earmarked for the new airport. It was dirt cheap to rent, abandoned houses were plentiful, and it came with an orchard and a large flower and vegetable garden. It was idyllic and doomed. Our hamlet, Maria Brunn, which means Mary's Fountain, or Mary's Well, of six or eight houses is now a runway. Mm -hmm. During that time in Maria Brunn, they were so impoverished, they lived off our vegetable patch <laughs> and the potatoes from the fields nearby. <laughs> they were really delicious <laughs> potatoes. <laughs> she came back with enough work for an exhibition from that summer. Of course, potato fields featured large among the paintings. I was astonished that it was possible to draw so much visual drama, such endless variations of greens and browns and golds from the earth and fields that was flooded with summer light, and above it all, the shifting blue and white theatricals of the sky. I had never properly looked at the area because it seemed so unremarkable. Jay's work taught me that nothing is insignificant. It taught me to look again, to see more and see deeper. And I've learned from her over the years with much joy and gratitude. I've seen her go from strength to strength and always remain true to herself and to her art. It is with the greatest pleasure that I declare this wonderful exhibition now open. <laughs> just wonderful, wonderful, uh, and goes very well with the exhibition. So that's all the formalities. Please continue to enjoy the exhibition. Thank you for your attention.